Assalamu alaikum everyone. It's been literally ages since I did any video on my YouTube and I'm really 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 sorry. But I get easily carried away with anything that is not relevant so let me get straight to the point. Today inshallah I want to share with you my story of how I became a Muslim. I am aware that I did upload it a few years ago and I rewatched it today and it's really really embarrassing by the way. <laughs> I feel first of all at the time, I still hadn't figured out my place, so it's very, um, I feel I don't come across as very confident and I'm very slow with my words and I'm searching for words, etc. I had just converted at the time. Uh, also, I feel it's not elaborate at all. Uh, I think that's also because I was still on shaky grounds with my own self. So I feel now, I've been Muslim seven years, and because you guys are always asking me to do a new and updated version of my story, Inshallah today is that day and I'm so proud of myself for finally doing it. So here goes. I'm Estonian. I'm born and raised in Estonia. And those of you who don't know what is Estonia, it is a Baltic country. It's very, very, very tiny. We're only 1.3 million people and uh, the Muslim percentage, I believe, is roughly around 0.04. Uh, so now there's of course way more converts, but back in the day when I converted, I didn't know anyone who was Muslim. So my entire journey starts when I am 14, but just to give you a rough background story, I was raised with no religion whatsoever. Um, my parents never talked to me about life before birth or life after death or any afterlife or any, any beliefs or anything. And that's also because they don't uh, necessarily practice anything as well. And I truly believe that you can live your entire life in Estonia without ever, ever, ever thinking about God and never questioning your existence or... It's just not something that comes up and the majority of the people in the country, they don't believe in any higher power. Some might be superstitious or spiritual, but not necessarily religious. No, it's not, it's not common to meet somebody who is religious. Even our grandparents, grand-grandparents, it's just not... It's just not there. So around the age of 14, um, we, me and my mom, we started traveling and uh, it was the first time in my life that I came across people of faith, which was, it wasn't something I necessarily processed right away, but it was the first time and it was very odd because my whole life I'm somewhat brought to believe that people who have faith are kind of people without a backbone weak people. They're just like someone you feel sorry for or something like that, which is really absurd. I realized that these people, they believe and they're normal people. So for me, I was like, something doesn't add up, like I don't get it. I didn't think much of it, but suddenly my circle of people changed a little bit, depending on who I would hang out with, the people who I would meet, then we would add each other later on like whatever MySpace or High Five or we have something called Orkut. And that slowly started changing my set of mind, my thoughts a little bit. Until one day, I believe now I'm around 16 years old. At one point, like Egypt became the most easiest, accessible, cheapest destination to travel to. And we realized we'd been to all the resorts for so many times and we decided to go to Cairo. And in Cairo, instead of paying for a hotel, we found it's cheaper to actually rent an apartment or a studio or something and we have more space and more freedom. So we rented an apartment in uh, a place called Rehab. And, uh, and, and, and me and my mom were always, always, always obsessed with uh, getting tanned and having darker skin. So I was always really sad that I'm really fair. So anytime I would always be the first girl at the beach and the last one to leave. And I had a really great, uh, I had a like very, very fake tan on myself all the time. Uh, so we started going to a club over there in Rahab. It was uh, just like it has not a club like for dancing, a club like, you know, tennis and swimming pools and gyms, etc. So uh, we started going over there and they had something called ladies days, which for me, it made life a lot easier because as a um, single girl, in the Middle East, you would kind of get unwanted attention. So for me, I was like, oh, ladies days, yay. I can feel like a lot more free and comfortable roaming around rather than uncomfortable. Uh, so one day I went without my mom and I was just taking a tan in my bikini. And then next to me, there were two other girls from Germany and they were taking a tan as well. So we started chatting and we became like, we really hit it off. Uh, it was Elizabeth and Annalise. I don't know if you guys remember me, but you're actually a part of my story and I don't think you know that. 
So um, we hit it off, we started chatting and everything and it turned out that they are German converts. It was the first time in my life that I heard about converts. I'm like, what is convert? In my mind, Islam was just something distant, something for Arabs, something in the Middle East, something you need to keep away from me because it ain't for a white girl like me in Estonia, you know? And uh, so I was like, okay, fine. And we, they just were talking about their life before and then how they found like true meaning in Islam. And um, I found that very interesting. Uh, that was it. I didn't think much of it. And then we, uh, the ladies' time finished and we're getting dressed and they cover up all of themselves like and they cover up like I mean cover up like really loosey clothes and hijab and everything and especially with this girl Elizabeth we hit it off really good and uh, she invited me over to her place and I went I've always been like that I'm very spa not spontaneous I'm not spontaneous I'm very I decide something in the moment and if I'm convinced I just go ahead with it and I don't second guess it so I went to her house and she pulled on the entire prayer outfit and I was like, okay, <laughs> this is the day I'm going to die. Um, so actually I was really, really shocked So because she's like this gorgeous woman and suddenly I see her doing all of these things. So it was really, really interesting for me and kind of it felt okay to take information from her because she's somebody who I could relate to. And uh, she just gave me some children books about Islam. Uh, which I was like, okay, fine, and I took them. So that was it. Uh, I went back to my place, and a few days later, I traveled back to Estonia. Then in the airport, another key person in my story, and Felicia. I don't think you also know you're a part of my story, but if you're watching, I hope you remember me. Uh, so we were in the Cairo airport, and we are on our way back, and we're flying with Czech Airlines, and I have a transit, and she also has a transit, and she stood in front of me in the line. So, of course, me, I'm really nosy, and I'm like, oh, what you doing? What's your name? How are you? And I see she's holding, like, an Arabic book, and I'm like, what are you doing? And she said, oh, actually, uh, my boyfriend's Muslim, and I just want to know what he believes. And in my mind, I was like, okay, that's very, like, open-minded of you. So she said, I just want to find out what he believes in. And so instead of... Uh, fighting against something I know nothing about, I decided to uh, learn the Quran and I've learned the alphabet by now and I'm slowly, slowly trying to read it. For me, I was like, what? And since we had time in our hands, I told her, um, can you please uh, teach it to me as well? So actually we had like a five hour transit, I think, and she taught me the entire alphabet at the time. And I think I still have that paper, by the way, of like Alif uh, and everything and how it comes in the beginning and how it's in the middle and how it's in the end. And uh, so I took that paper and I went my own way. At the time, I'm 16 or 17, I'm not sure. And I just went back home and I snoozed. I didn't think about it again. Uh, I hid those children books under my bed. And uh, I would just keep them there. Like, so my parents don't get a heart attack and think I'm going crazy or something. I would just put the children's books there. I just uh, gazed at them and I was like, okay, that's nice. And whatever. I continued with school. I lived my life. And... Um, but then somehow it, didn't, it couldn't shake me, like I didn't, I, somehow these girls, they put questions in my mind that I'd never thought about before, like where do I come from, where am I going, what's the purpose of life, uh, I'm just going to be like food for worms, why do I ever get up from the couch, or why do I make an effort, or there were these questions that they would just spin around in my mind, and somehow over the course of time, I, I, I develop an understanding that it, it, it does make sense that there's a higher creator. But I never felt the need to have a religion. I never had that... Uh, um, I never felt like I have to label myself. I think a year went by or so. And then I just... I couldn't shake that feeling that, no, like, this can't be it. Like, you know, I looked around me and I would think... And I'm very surprised that I was like this, by the way. I'm a young, young teenage girl at the time. So, like, subhanAllah. And I'm like, this can't be it. So I started slowly, slowly looking into religions. My best friend at the time, she converted to Christianity. So that was something on my radar. Uh, but I, I never fully understood the concept of Jesus. Um, I, I didn't understand how come I don't have to pray to Adam. or And then I thought maybe it's my lack of knowledge. Like I'm not convinced because I don't know enough. So I thought, okay, uh, I should study it, right? Where to get the righteous knowledge, where to get authentic knowledge. That was always the issue because whatever you Google, just like garbage comes up. But then I, it didn't answer my questions. For me personally, I am not saying anything against Christians, but for me, it never answered any of my questions. Rather, 
I always felt more insecure and I felt I have more questions and I was even more confused and I was like Matthew who and Luke who and and there's only a translation and there's no original and there's so many versions and then the Trinity and it just for me personally it didn't add up and the same thing with Judaism and uh, every other religion that I ever saw out there believed in so many gods and I didn't feel that that's for me I felt like there has to be this one creator and I'm convinced that I just need to I need to I need to know and uh, honestly like believe it or not when Christianity didn't work out for me and I was really bummed out I was like this was my chance and now it's gone and uh, I wanted to believe now I don't have a religion I don't have anything else out there and like I never actually seriously thought about Islam as looking at it as something I could convert to and you know like it's really weird to say that now, but at the time I felt like Christianity would be a, such an easy way out and such an easy answer to all my questions. Like, yes, I would have to change, but not drastically. I could still eat the same way and dress the same way. And I would, ha would have found my path, but I can go to church like once a week. And that was a very naive way of thinking. But for me, it just seemed to be like the last piece of the puzzle. And it seemed like life would have been so much easier if it could have just ended with that. Like I found Christianity and that's it. My parents would have still been shocked. It's not, it's still taboo to convert to anything. Even if you convert to Judaism or Christianity or whatnot, what, anything, it would build, still be something weird that your family would be like, you crazy? So, so I remember one day in the end of high school, I remember one day in the end of high school, somehow on Google it came up that there's a small apartment in Estonia that has something to do with Muslims or something. So I thought, I asked my mom, like, can you drive me there? I just want to check it out. Like, what is this? And my mom was like so scared because when I walked in, all like women in black were entering and we'd never seen anything like that in Estonia. We'd never seen a woman with covered hair in Estonia before. Uh, so I went in. And that was honestly like actually an experience that put me off. The moment I entered, they put a hijab on me and I had no idea what is that. Uh, it was very, very strange. I don't agree with this kind of approach. Uh, but anyway, it was what it is. And at the time, there was only a small apartment that they would rent out for Jumu'ah uh, every Friday for prayers and there would be a small class. In Estonia, there's a small sect of Muslims called the Tataris. With, uh, they originate from Russia. Um, so their first language is Russian, which I can understand to a certain degree, but I cannot study religion in it and I'm not fluent in it. And there was one girl, Amina, who spoke Estonian as well. So throughout the entire lecture, she would translate things to me. And I saw it actually pissed everyone else off a little bit because they couldn't focus on what was being said because someone was always like... Uh, but I did have a notebook and I had a pencil and I was very prepared. And I remember that was the day I learned the first thing ever that I actually knew about Islam, which was the, the hadith that if you see something wrong happening, you should forbid it with your hands, so by your actions. And if you cannot, then with your words. And if you cannot, then forbid it in your heart. And that's actually the first thing I ever learned about Islam, which is now a nice memory. But uh, I wasn't captivated by this experience. Give me some pamphlets and printouts because at the time there were no books in Estonian. Uh, so I took those uh, papers and everything and I hid them under my bed and uh, so I kept them there again for a while and every now and then I would read them and look into them uh, and you know now try to think of yourself as a non-Muslim who has never read any religious books so all the Muslims who are looking at this you know we have Quran and Hadith and Bukhari and Muslim and uh, Tirmidhi and all of these things and verses in the Quran etc and we number them so when I opened those books I had no idea how to read them and I was so confused. The books were like a quote and like thy thouest thy Tirmidhi 7722 book 5 uh, Bakara 7742 colon uh, quote another quote two two words uh, like I was like huh? I didn't know how to read that thing and I think that's something that doesn't occur to any Muslim writer who writes these books because if you've never seen something like that, you have no idea what's going on. So I put all those books aside and I felt my only chance to study this faith is if someone tells me. And I'm like, who's going to tell me? I don't know a single Estonian Muslim who, who will tell me or explain to me. And in the internet, everything was garbage, like I said.
Everything I found was websites trying to bring Islam down, books about forbidden love and like honor murders and everything like that. So it was really it was hard to find authentic knowledge. So I kind of kept it. But there was one book, A Brief Illustrative Guide to Understanding Islam. It was in English and that was fairly easy to read. And actually in time, now if I look at myself in retrospect, if I would talk to other people, I would defend the point of view of Islam. But if someone would have ever asked me, are you Muslim? I'll be like, are you out of your mind? The first time I ever opened the Quran, believe it or not, I had a sticky note and I wrote down everything I didn't like. I graduated high school and I decided to take a gap year because I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And in the course of that gap year, I actually started getting more into studies of religion, slowly, slowly. So now, but like now it's been years that I'm into this topic. Uh, but everything I ever studied and the journey I went through, it was all me. I never told my parents, I never told my friends. It's something that's not, I don't think you would find a lot of people's sympathy. Maybe now a little bit more, but back then, like, no, I never even thought about sharing it with anyone. So I was still stuck in that same place. I had belief in God and I felt like, okay, he knows I believe in him. That should be good enough. I shouldn't need a religion to label myself. But in time, like I said, it wasn't enough. I felt like if I'm here, then I should probably do something. And I didn't know what that something was. So I was on the looks, I was on the lookout for that something. Said I started actually subconsciously believing in what Islam teaches, but I would never admit to myself that I was Muslim or even that I believed in Islam. So I started this kind of like cat mouse game with my own self, like I would believe, but I would convince myself that I don't. So I was actually looking for something wrong with it to convince myself that this is not it because it's terrifying. I just kept somehow stumbling onto information that was all about comparative religion and Islam did make the most sense, but then still I would deny it because it was, it was just scary. I was scared when I still wasn't a believer. I remember somebody asking me that, okay, Let's pretend that in the end God's not real and it's not there. So the believing person is asking me, what will I have lost? Nothing. I was always aiming to be a better person. I always tried harder. I tried better and I had God by my side. And what will you have lost? Nothing. But on the other side, do you dare to even imagine if God is real? What will happen in the end? What's going to happen to me? I'm good. What's going to happen to you? If you had all the signs and you ignored them. You are one tiny girl from Estonia. Do you, do you have the courage to take that responsibility of deciding that no, there is no higher power, there is no God, and this is not my path? And I remember that scared the heck out of me. And there was, this was something that really motivated me. I was always in the back of my mind. I was like, what if there's a 0.01% that I'm not right? I'm not smart enough. I'm not clever enough. I don't have a bachelor's, master's, PhD. I don't have anything. Do I have the courage of saying that no, this is not it? Uh, so that was something that really motivated me and pushed me to try harder and go stronger. The, one day online, I was just uh, looking for ways to study Arabic and I found out that actually an Islamic center had opened up in Estonia and there was going to be classes for Arabic and those classes were free. I'd never seen anything free in my life before so obviously I was like, no, I need a spot in this class, I need to take this class. So automatically I signed up and the teacher of the Arabic class was actually a convert who had studied Arabic and done her master's degree on it in uh, Sorbonne in France. So she was actually the only person qualified to teach Arabic and to teach something within the scopes of Islam in Estonia. But I was not signing myself up for an Islamic class, I was signing myself up for an Arabic class. So I did uh, go to that Arabic class, but she automatically signed me up to the Islamic class as well. And I was like, hey girl, no. But then I was like, why wouldn't I take it? I'm already on this quest, might as well. It's not gonna hurt, but I was so scared to go to that mosque or Islamic center. I don't know why. I find that a lot of the converts who message me, they, they're they also really, really scared to enter the mosque. And I don't know why that is, but it's just what it is, okay. So I went and it was the first time in my life I entered that classroom and it was like 20 women exactly like me. Everyone had the same questions like, where do I come from? Where do I go? What's my purpose in life? And I'd never seen that before, especially Estonian. So these girls actually became my friends for the next two years, my closest group of friends. And there was a girl as young as 15 and there was a woman who was like 55. And it was so diverse, but everyone united and connected by the exact same thing. So it was, this was just mind blowing. And it was the first time in a really long time I felt like I belonged somewhere. 
And the teacher, like, mashallah, she was amazing. I think a large part of my journey is because she was teaching as well as she did. And she really inspires me as a person, as a Muslim. Uh, so we sat down and she printed for us a book that we binded together ourselves. It was one part Estonian, one part how to pronounce it in Estonian, and one part uh, the Arabic. And then a lot of tafsir in the bottom. So we sat down and we started with the Fatiha and uh, she, 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 she taught it in a really good way. Like She opened up everything to the last tiny detail. Like Bismillah, Bi, Ism, Allah, by name, God. And the tafsir of like three or four lines, so tafsir i.e. the explanation of a few lines would take us like two to three hours and the time would go like that and then we would listen to Ahmed Al-Ajmi and uh, hear how it's supposed to sound and it was it was just a really 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 nice class actually the first day after the class we closed the books I was like okay nice and I don't know for what reason I went home and I memorized Fatiha that day so that comes to help me later when one day I learn to pray but I don't know why I think I thought it was exotic or something I learned the Fatiha but with every class that I kept going and I kept going and I kept going I realized this is the only thing I'm waiting forward to my entire week and I loved it I loved it it wasn't about, about let me see what they believe it was about like I can't wait to find out what else I believe in it became about me and it became about somehow your heart being so convinced that this is the truth and I was actually a really really annoying student like I feel so bad for her, but I think now it makes me better in dealing with others about Islam because I was really annoying with my questions. So I feel like there isn't many things you can ask me that I would be like, up, 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 up. I don't know how to take this. Uh, like I'd be like, aha, uh -huh, okay. You say that there's an angel on both sides and the angels don't come to the bathroom. So what if I murder someone in the bathroom? It doesn't count. So I was like a really, really annoying student. And she was just like, Irene, stop. Uh, so actually being this annoying and trying to find something wrong with it was what actually affirmed my faith in the end. Trying to find something wrong with it actually led me down the path of true faith because I discovered there is nothing wrong with it, subhanAllah. Um, so that was that. Every class was the best time of my life. I made great friends. I loved the lessons and I internalized everything. I would go home. All I wanted to do was live and breathe Islam. But I didn't practice anything. Let's say this was my Qur'an, I was sitting there nicely, okay, it came time for prayer, everybody would go, even the other new students, and then me, I was just like, I wait. And then everyone would come back from prayer break, and I was like, okay, let's continue studying the Qur'an now. So I like, it didn't click believing and practicing, it didn't go hand in hand for me, I believed, but it was kind of still on the snooze button somewhere. So uh, I started these classes in December 2010. So skip forward to April 2011, that's where we are now with my timeline. And I remember very, very clearly, it was the 10th of April 2011. And uh, I had a pen pal called Matthew uh, from Wales. And uh, we were chatting for like a, quite, a couple of years, I think. And we were just like, play, play Yahtzee online and I don't know what. And I remember he was Christian and I would always be like, he was one of those people, I was like, really, Christian, and you're normal? That's interesting, you believe? Hmm, nice. So he was one of those people that in the beginning of my journey, I was convinced that, wow, people of religion can be normal people. I was very surprised. And we would chat and play and like, whatever, just, we're kids. And uh, so one day he stopped responding to my messages and I've never met him, obviously. We just chat and play games online. And uh, he didn't respond, he didn't respond, and then um, I texted him, like, what's wrong, what's this, what's that? And then I go on his Facebook profile, and I remember it's the 10th of April because it's my mom's birthday. And I'm sitting in the living room floor, and I go on his Facebook, and I watch his entire Facebook feed, and everyone is leaving, rest in peace, rest in peace, rest in peace, Matthew. And I was like, what? Okay, I have to say this now. I'd never dealt with death in my life until that point. Like, alhamdulillah, I was lucky enough, nobody in my life died until that point. I didn't know how to deal with it. And honestly, I freaked out. And I remember, I went like caps lock and everything, and I was like, how, what is wrong with you people? And like, how can you do this? How can you say this? This is such a sick joke, and I don't know what. And I was crying, and my mom was seeing me crying. My mom's like, oh my god, what happened? I didn't get it, I didn't get it at all. And the first instinct I had was that I have to pray for him. And then my second instinct was, I don't know how to pray. So I remember that from the Qur'an classes I'm currently attending in the Islamic Center, they gave me like a booklet on how to pray. I opened the booklet up. Okay, I was like, okay, I'm going to be the first Muslim who does not know how to pray. 
I am the first Muslim who couldn't pray. Uh, so I was like, okay, what do I remember? What do I remember? Okay, we'll do you have to clean yourself at the time I still had fake nails long gel nails and I remember that you can't do wudu, uh, you can't clean you can't uh, clean yourself with, for prayer um, If you have fake nails and I was like, okay, dear God, sorry nails mm, what to do? Uh, so I googled how to do it and I was following the instructions like uh-huh how, how to wash uh-huh Okay, then like what okay? I know we have to cover Okay, I had like a towel on my head and a robe and uh, so okay, I cut the book into uh, sheets and papers and I put them all around me in a half a circle and I was praying to God that my mom doesn't come in my room because if my mom sees me like bowing down somewhere, it's going to be the end of me. So I put all of it around and I'm still crying and uh, okay, okay, what? And you know how standing is one position, uh, so like half bow is second position, sujood, uh, prostrating is uh, the third position. So the book says like, let's say, uh, Aisha prayer, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one, one, two, 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 and I was just like, what? I'm going to be the first Muslim who cannot pray. And uh, okay, so I try and I look and I saw a video, okay, mm-hmm, okay, I got this. So I start. And okay, I read from every single page that's around me. Ashwat, Ash, and now I remember. I already know Fatiha, so that was the easy part for me. But everything else, I had no idea what's happening. I was like, Ashwat, okay, Bismillah. Okay, and I did it. And my first prayer took me. Can you believe it or not? Twenty-five minutes. But somehow it felt like that. It felt like the quickest prayer in my life. Um, so that was it. I went back to my computer and I found that Matthew's dad had messaged me and said that Matthew was born with an illness called cystic fibrosis and uh, they knew from a very young age that he is going to die, uh, that he's going to die young. And uh, like I told you before in the story, if I have an instinct and I believe it's the right thing to do, I will do it and I will not think twice. I booked a plane ticket. I told my mom I need to go. And my mom's always been like this in my life. That's why I love her. Unfortunately, I know I'm never going to be like that with my own kid. But whenever she was, she saw that I'm convinced with something, she trusted me enough to let me do it if I felt it's the right thing to do. So I went, I arrived like 2 a.m. in the middle of Wales. Never been to Wales. I'm a teenager at the time. I arrived to Wales. It's dark. It's 2 a.m. Never seen Matthew. Never seen his family. Someone is going to pick me up who's not even from his family. But I did it. For, for some reason, I had such a strong inclination in my heart that I have to do this. And I arrived, and his family welcomed me like my own. Uh, they took me in, and I felt like I'm a celebrity when I arrived there. Everybody knew who I was. There was like two, three hundred people, and they all knew who I was. And I was like, oh my god, you're Arlene. Oh my god, da, 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 da. And I was like, what is happening? And the first time that I ever met Matthew was when he was in his casket. You know, they do open casket funerals and they ask me if I need a time or like a moment uh, with him on my own. And uh, they just left me in a room with Matthew's dead body in a casket. And that was the most surreal moment in my entire life. I couldn't come to terms first with his death. I couldn't come to terms why he didn't tell me anything. Because the last message that he ever sent me was that I need to tell you something. I was a young girl who didn't know how to cope. I had no idea what's happening or what's going on. Um, and the only thing I kept repeating to myself is that his death meant something, his death meant something, his death meant something. It's the day I started to pray and I'm never going to give it up. And subhanAllah, I never stopped praying. Till today, I've never missed a prayer. And I don't know when I would have started practicing Islam if it wasn't for this. That was the, it's so crazy. So his parents welcomed me. I slept in the morning. It was the funeral. The mom said he's not, she's not going to go to the funeral. She can't bury her own son. I've never cried like that in my life. You, need, you know, when you see somebody else's sorrow, it, it can internalize. And it's, it was the saddest thing I've ever seen in my life. And we entered the church for the funeral, me and the mom and the dad. Can you believe it? We've never met. They don't know who I am, anything. And it's the three of us holding hands, walking to the funeral, and we've never... Who am I? You know, like, who am I? And I've never cried like that in my whole life. And every time I would have a free break, I would I carried something with me, and I would try to pray, again, with my papers and my booklet and everything. And um, 
I took prayers slowly. At first I took one, then two, then three, then four, and then Fajr came later. But that was the day I started. And uh, so I came back. I remember I told everyone in the Islamic Center, like I was holding very deep conversations, how like, oh my God, everything you taught. I told my teacher that, oh my God, everything you taught me, how you're never supposed to take tomorrow for granted and don't go to sleep expecting that you're going to wake up in the morning and don't wake up in the morning expecting to return to bed in the night. You never know what's tomorrow. And that really, really, really shook me. And my teacher was like, yes, that's why you need to act. Are you ready to take your shahada? And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. So she's like, can you write me a short story about your story with Islam so I can put it on our local website? And I was like, okay, fine. And I wrote together a draft. And uh, my last sentence was, inshallah, one day I'm going to be a good Muslim. And she messaged me back. She's like, what do you mean one day you're going to be a good Muslim? And I was like, I'm not one now. And she's like, oh, sweetheart, as soon as you believe in la ilaha illallah, it means that you're Muslim. I was like, what? So I, I remember, like, even though it was all happening, I had never for a split second thought of myself as a Muslim. And I was like, oh my God, then I was freaking out, freaking out, freaking out, because no one in my family doesn't even know I'm investigating anything. Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christian, anything. They don't know anything. And I'm going to be like, greetings, people. I'm Muslim now. So I was like, oh my God, I was freaking out. For the next couple of months, I remember I was consciously trying to leave signs for my mom that at least I believe in something. Like, oh mother, I attended this conference and oh mother, have you ever contemplated over life and death? And oh mother, I think there's a higher creator. It doesn't make sense. Like I would always start leaving little hints and clues because I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, they're going to think I lost my mind. So anyway, and then again, she's like, are you ready to take your shahada? And I'm like... No, everything for me started in Egypt. I want to do it in Egypt. And she's like, uh, sweetheart, you are the one who, are, who just witnessed that there might not be a tomorrow. Are, are you willing to take that risk and wait? You don't know when you're going to go again. And then uh, she's like, I want to do something. I want to do something. I want to take a group shahada so all the girls in the class get the chance to do this together. So I was like, wow, that's something really, really unique, especially for a country like Estonia when we're only one million people and nobody's Muslim. So, yeah, that's it. I said, okay. On the 14th of May, 2011, we took our shahada. We were 12 girls and one boy. Everyone in a row. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Everyone was crying. Everyone was, of course, like, Allahu Akbar. And uh, it was just a crazy day. Like, I remember all those girls. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I remember also not having anyone to share it with. I went home like it was any other day, uh, couldn't show my happiness, couldn't show my excitement, uh, but inside of me I was like, oh my god, I'm Muslim now. And I remember a few months after I'd taken my shahada, it was Ramadan. Ramadan in Estonia at the time, uh, sunset was 10.45 p.m. and time for the dawn prayer, which um, is when you have to start fasting, was at 2. So I thought, I'm going to be the first Muslim who cannot fast. But subhanAllah, actually, I asked for my same teacher to give me a class or like a lecture on what is Ramadan and how to behave in Ramadan. And it was actually very, very helpful. And despite the extremely long hours, I think it was one of the easiest Ramadans that I've ever had. But of course, I was fasting in secret. And it was hard, but I didn't feel the hardship at the time. I've been Muslim for seven years, and I've never felt the way... I felt back then, yes, it was hard and life was a struggle and I didn't belong anywhere and didn't have any friends and my family didn't know. I was Muslim for secret for years. For years I would pray in secret, fast in secret, alone, always alone. But at that time your Islam is so strong, it's like your drug, if I can explain it that way. It, you, it, you're so high on it, you're oblivious to everything that is a hardship because of it. And uh, that time, unfortunately, it does not last, but it's a very, very beautiful time. So if you're in it now, make the most out of it because it shall pass. Um, but it was an amazing time. You feel like you finally found your purpose. You feel like you were blind, but now you can see. You feel like everything is okay in the end of the day. Your life has meaning. Your life has purpose. There's someone by your side. There's someone to turn to. There's a bigger picture. Um, there's a reason for everything. So you have this inner peace and this inner peace and light is what I wish for every person in the world and it would so often make me sad to think that there are people who don't have it 
it doesn't have to be Islam that gives it to you, but I just wish that you that you have it. It's such a beautiful feeling to find your purpose in life. So yeah, alhamdulillah. And I remember like in university, some exchange students would be Muslims. And for me now, it's something that I identify myself as. And I would see like uh, Kuwaitis and I don't know what. And I would walk up to them and be like, hello, I'm also Muslim. So people would be like, okay, good for you. It was always hard with the people who knew you before Islam. The new people in your life, they don't know you any other way. So it was a lot easier. So it was a lot easier for me to have a new environment. And then from moment one, I kind of tried to make the people who became close to me know that I'm Muslim right away so they can either decide they want to be my friend or they don't. Um, and I remember I would design my university schedules according to prayer. I would run out between classes, make wudu somewhere, take the tram, pray in a clothing store, like fitting room. Uh, but I would make it happen. In this time, you're oblivious to the hardship kind of because you're just so happy and so blessed and so excited to be Muslim um, that alhamdulillah God makes the hardship kind of fade away uh, hardship comes after because we all know we're going to be tested with that which we love most and if God grants you such an amazing gift of course he will make sure that you earn it and deserve it I finished university I studied to be an English teacher and I realized if I want to make it for myself I cannot stay where I am a teacher salary is too low I'm not married, my family is not Muslim, I have to provide for myself and I can't do it here. How am I ever going to have a community? How am I ever going to feel like I belong? How am I ever going to wear the hijab? Uh, all of these questions in my life. Uh, so I was determined to change my life and I did, but it came at a price. And it was, to get to where I am today was the most difficult, it was the most difficult journey I've ever embarked in my life. I ended up in Ghana, in Singapore, in Morocco, in Holland, um, till I finally reached Qatar, where I live now, and we're happily married. Alhamdulillah. Um, that was such and such a roller coaster, and it's a completely different story. So, inshallah, I will share that with you in episode two. And uh, but yes, truly, Islam is the best thing that ever happened to me, and I'm still so shocked till today that God chose me out of all the people in the world. And it is a blessing, and uh, inshallah, we never take it for granted. And I hope you liked my story, and I hope you found something beneficial in it. And um, yeah, wishing you lots of peace and love, and uh, see you soon. Bye. Assalamu alaikum. Mwah.